In this episode, Adam's pilgrimage takes him through Tuscany, an important region in the history of Italy, and in particular, the very influential city of Florence. This city was a powerful city-state in the centuries prior to unification, just over 150 years ago. As the world took on the heart and the thinking of Renaissance Florence, I want to understand if pasta was part of the scene here. Adam's journey through Tuscany starts in Florence, where he speaks with Elena about the Medici family's influence. Then he's off to Villa Artimino to talk and cook game. And finally, he visits the Chianti region to learn just what all the fuss is about. This is my pilgrimage. Come share the journey with me. The influence of Florence reflected the power of the wealthy ruling family, the Medici. The Medici family are attributed as being at the heart of the Renaissance. Adam speaks to Elena, a guide and Medici expert, about why. We are next to San Lorenzo Church, right in the middle of Florence, close to Florence's cathedral. And we are exactly in one of the most elegant Renaissance cloisters of Florence. This is exactly the church where the Medici family used to come to Mass every single Sunday. And this is still the burial place for the entire family. Can you tell me a bit more about the Renaissance period? Well, the Renaissance is one of the most delightful cultural periods in the world. And it starts exactly in Florence at the beginning of the 1400s. The Medici family were involved with this period because they invited to Florence um, the elite, the cultural elite, and they really made Florence one of the most elegant centers of the culture in Europe. Actually, the Renaissance and the mm. Medicis are related because the Medici were one of the most richest families ever. Have a look at what we have inside. Oh, wow. This is one of the most prestigious antique coins which were issued from Florence in mm -hmm. the 1200s. So the Medici started as money changers and then later on in the 1400s they became bankers. Wow. They invested so much money, so much of this income in art, in pure beauty, public utility. With this wealth there would have been great banquets and grand food I'm guessing. Certamente, <laughs> of course. The Medici exactly expressed their richness even by the number of dishes that they served for banquets or for special occasions. And by the way, we have an interesting tree here. The orange. The oranges, yes. The Medici had a very elegant, big collection of citrus plants, such as Mela Rancho, that Catherine de Medici used to cook yes. with duck. Duck a orange. No. <laughs> no, it comes from Florence. Ah. It was a Renaissance dish. Good. And was there any pasta dishes? Was there pappardelle? Yeah, the pappardelle, especially um, topped with wild boar ragù or pheasant or quail. Pappardelle means to? Pappardelle comes from the Florentine verb pappare, pappare. <laughs> which means eat with pleasure. Very nice. Much of what Adam has seen in past episodes is the rise in popularity of pasta with the ordinary person. But Tuscany, with its history of extreme wealth, would have had an abundance of produce to choose from. The wealthy Tuscans love to eat pappardelle. When I spoke to Elena before, she mentioned pappardelle, papare, to eat with passion. I remember my nonna telling me one thing about food, to keep it simple and to use the best quality ingredients you can get your hands on. This seems to be the way of life here in Tuscany. Pappardelle, a pasta that is wide, flat and sumptuous 
a fitting pasta for the wealthy. But here in Tuscany, you also get the sense that the ruling families had some great ingredients to cook with their pasta. Adam went to Villartimino to find out what the social elite ate during the Renaissance. This is the grand villa from the Medici family from the Renaissance era. What did they eat? After the break, Adam discovers the social elite were hunters and meets a chef who reveals the secrets of Catholic. This is the grand villa from the Medici family from the Renaissance era. What did they eat? Well, as you said, we are in uh, Villa Artimino or Villa La, La Ferdinanda. Uh, it was built in 1596 by Montalenti, the architect Montalenti, ordered by uh, the Medici family. Uh, Artimino, like most of the villas that you can see here on the walls, uh, it used to be by the Medici family for hunting and to enjoy, obviously, what they used to hunt. So uh, in Artimino, uh, normally they used to eat obviously the meat that they used to hunt during the day. In Artimino and in Italy and in Tuscany, most of the Medici uh, plates and cuisine are still used today. And I'm getting to cook one of them later on. I'm looking forward to that. And I'm looking forward to tasting it. <laughs> you can see why Tuscan recipes are tied to the agriculture of the area. Olives, vines, herbs and vegetables, all used in simple and tasty dishes. I'm really keen to learn a traditional recipe that would have been part of the opulent banquets here in Tuscany. I heard back in the day that there was a cook that cooked these big, extravagant, rich dishes. And it happened to be a female cook. And today I have a female chef next to me, Michaela. Hello, how are you? Hello, very well. Good. Thank you. So we're going to be cooking one of these Medici recipes, yes? Yeah, actually it was. It's a recipe of Caterina de Medici, that she was a part of the Medici family. Uh -huh. And she was cooking this ragu uh, made with duck. And uh, here we have the duck meat that has been minced. And then we will use uh, onion, celery mm -hmm. and carrot. Okay. And a little bit of uh, our red wine and tomato sauce. Fantastic, so we get into cooking. Yeah, can you help me? Of course, yeah. I would love to. So we use a little bit of uh, olive oil. Good okay. amount. Yeah, uh, quite a, a little bit more, that's Beautiful. fine. And then we start with all the ingredients, uh, onion and carrot. Celery. Lovely. Fry it a little bit more and then we will add the, the, uh, duck. the duck. We use all the, the duck, we use the, the part of the uh, flesh and the part of the fat. Now that it's almost uh, all cooked, we add, yeah, we add the wine and just a little bit like this. And now we reduce to zero. These Medici recipes, are you still using some of them on your menu today? Uh, yeah, I just modify them a little bit because they are all long cooking. And, okay. But uh, there are a few recipes uh, of Caterina de Medici, as I thought before. Yeah. I, I really love her because like a, a woman, I really love to, yeah, to do yeah, some of her... Power in the kitchen. Yeah, yes. some of her recipes. <laughs> and uh, I like to do the duck al orange. Okay. Or we do the, mm, uh, the omelette or the oh. bechamel. That they are original. People think that they are French, but yeah. they are original from, uh, from Tuscany, actually. Oh, right. yeah. <laughs> so at this point, that is reduced, we add uh, the tomato sauce. Okay. Okay, like this. Mix that through. So this dish, what pasta would they use? What type of pasta, okay. traditionally? For this dish, uh, we can use all the kind of pasta. So obviously today I brought you along some linguine. Okay, yeah, very good. dry linguine, so we'll get that cooking as well. After the break, the results of Michaela's effort. Yeah, I think the pasta is ready now. Oh, uh, yeah, I can see. I can, you can see. see. You yeah. can see it. Yeah, I can see it. It's, it's ready. Mm. Let's plate it up. It's ready. And oh. just... I'm hungry after all this hard work. Okay, so we just serve it. Mm. Looks so good. Ah, using the ladle to spin that perfect. Yeah, that's the trick. That's what I love about food and cooking. You learn something every day. Yeah. Okay. Well, and, and I actually uh, add ah, that in my little tea. Okay. <laughs> you love it? 
Yeah, look, that is absolutely delicious. Thank you so much for showing me that dish today. You're it was welcome. absolute pleasure. You're welcome. Ciao, Adam. Ciao, next, yeah. See you next time. Yes, definitely. <laughs> A hearty duck ragu enjoyed by the Tuscan elite. Adam's driving west of Florence to Vinci, which is not only famous for Leonardo, it's also famous for his next Tuscan ingredient. These beautiful rolling hills of Vinci are the home to some of the best olive trees in all of Italy. Adam speaks with a very passionate producer to discuss quality. It's a process that is about, uh, it's, it's quite complicated, mm -hmm. but uh, um, it's very yeah. Dimitri we, explains we, the process we, and finishes with uh, a, it must be filtered must, after two days. Immediately, not after within the, the same moment when it comes out. It must immediately be filtered, yes. We must filter it immediately, not after two days. After okay, okay, I get the message, Dimitri. Filter it straight away. With that, let's try the difference in the two. Okay. Okay, some other brands, yep. Other brands. So, uh, just smell on this one, what do you smell? You should smell on the oh, nose. Olives, straight away, fruity. Grass, fresh. Grass, green. A cutting. good oil should be fresh, green, green nature. You should smell so all resembles. that what you see here. Yeah, 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 no. And in, in, in the mouth then, the oil is not only fruity, it's a bit bitter. And mm. after uh, three, five seconds, it's sharp. It, 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 it not burns. burns. Yeah, yeah, you can feel like, that, definitely. Oh, yeah. that, is, that is amazing. Yeah, you're right, the grassiness. Then the fruity, and then that sharpness down the good back. Good oil should be like this. I can definitely taste the difference between the two oils there. I can taste the love and the attention to detail you put into your product. Thank you so much for today. Thank Good you. Grazie. The Medici family designated the Chianti region nearly 300 years ago and the premium wines would have been served along with the pasta at all the great feasts. Adam speaks with the owners of Fattoria Viticcio to learn more. I'm here today in beautiful Chianti region, Italy, and I'm with Alessandro and Nicoletta. Alessandro is a fifth generation winemaker. Very nice to meet you both. Yes, I learned making wine from my grandfather. From your you grandfather. <laughs> the Chianti region itself, how does that govern the different, because it's Chianti and then it's Chianti Classico. Yes, Three? you know, um, Chianti and Chianti Classico is uh, very confusing, uh, <laughs> but not only abroad, you know, also in, in Italy, you know, if you go outside Tuscany, yes. maybe 10% of the population knows the difference between. Mm. May I show you by... Definitely, uh, please. No? The original area producing uh, Chianti was uh, this one. Okay. Here there is Florence and here there is Siena. I was born in Florence and she was born in Siena, for example. Is there a you know? big rivalry there between Florence yes, and Siena? Yes, when she says I was born in Siena, my comment is, uh, so nobody's perfect, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, then, you know, uh, the wine produced in this area was a regular Chianti at that time, was one of the few wines uh, uh, able to cross the ocean to go in the States and still drinkable. Okay. Uh, so for this reason, in the past, uh, they had uh, some problems of not enough wine to export in the States. Mm. So they decided, the government decided, to enlarge this producing area like this. Wow. Passing all over Tuscany. This area is around... Uh, 10 times the area of the original Chianti Classico area. And, but the producers of this area, they asked something to recognize the wine produced in this small area. So now, okay. in this bigger area, we produce Chianti. And in this area, we produce Chianti Classico. Ah, now I'm the, understanding. Uh, our uh, symbol, our emblem, is the black rooster. On all, on all our bottles of wine, there is the black rooster to recognize that it is produced in this small original part of uh, Chianti area. So in that small region, that little Chianti region there, Classico, has the rooster. Yeah. And then the outside? No, no rooster. No, no rooster. Exactly. Okay. Well, 
I think there's enough talking about it. We need to try some of these uh, fantastic tasting is, wines. Tasting is more important than talking. It is. It's like, it's like what, food. You, you, know, yeah. you can look at it and talk yeah. about it, but you need to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> and we need to drink in this case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes. so this one here is the Chianti Classico. This is the regular Chianti Classico. This is 2012. Very nice. Mm. And we spend a lot of energy and money into the vineyards in order to grow the best grapes. Yes. Because our, not secret, you know, our policy is uh, to have a very low yield per vine. Basically, we produce one bottle of wine per vine. Wow. Uh, and this is the reason of this uh, high quality wine. You know? For being a regular Chianti Classico, this has the, 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 the limit, mm. uh, the regulation to be also a Gran Selezione. But, but for also a Gran Selezione, it has to be really something really outstanding. Okay. To me, that is outstanding. Mm. That is just perfect. That is a perfect food wine. Mm. It goes with everything. And then, yeah, exactly, because in Tuscany we produce wine to be used, to be drunk with food. Yeah. Not for meditation or uh, only no. for tasting. <laughs> and, not sit, and not to sit on the shelf we and leave it no, 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 no. No, no, and that's no. what I love. Salute. 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 Cheers. Salute. <laughs> You know, these programs take me to some pretty unforgettable places, but it's the people that make the journey really special. To quote Robert Browning, open my heart and you'll see graves inside of it. Italy. It is perhaps a great paradox that the lavish and the simple join together in Tuscany that the nobleman's game and wine combine so well with the rural peasant's herbs and olive oil to make a rich sauce. Tuscany has an abundance of amazing produce and Michaela's recipe has inspired me to create my own ragu using goat. For the full list of ingredients and method, visit adamspastapilgrimage.com. The first step to this recipe is to get the goat sealed off in the pan. So we need to add some olive oil in. So, diced goat into the pan. And that's what we're looking for, that sizzle. Make sure that you move the goat all around nice and evenly in the pan. That way, the goat will seal all the edges, all the way around. Season. Needs a good amount of salt and pepper now to your meat. So, a couple of minutes on each side sealing all the flavour of the goat and it starts the base to our ragu sauce. At this point, take the goat meat out of the pan, just place it onto a plate. No need to change the pan. All that beautiful goat flavour is in the pan, so we start the next process. In with some butter, some garlic, so one and a half cloves, rosemary. Now, no need to chop, just take it straight off the sprig like so, getting the leaves into the pan. I'm going to add a splash more olive oil. This will help stop the butter from burning. Turn up the heat. Add in our white wine. Now, some people may say, why not use red wine? Because I'm using a red meat. I like to use white wine. It's a little bit softer. And with the goat meat, it's going to work perfect. OK, the wine has reduced by half. Now in with chicken stock. Crushed tomatoes. Give your sauce a stir. And back in with the goat meat. All oh, that amazing juice that's come off the goat. Oh. Another little key point here is to make sure that the goat is totally submerged in the sauce. That way it cooks nice and evenly and becomes super tender. So that's going to take about an hour and a half. You need to cover it with a lid, bring it up to the boil and now it's a simmer. And then we're going to cook our pasta. Look at that. The goat is looking nice and tender. The sauce is reduced down and comes this really rich red colour. We're going to be adding our pappardelle straight into this pan. So, just grab your beautiful pappardelle nest, drop them into the sauce with the goat. Just be gentle. Now, if there's not enough liquid in the sauce and you're a little bit worried, just add a little bit of stock just to help cook the pasta nice and evenly. Place the lid on top, and what happens is the steam will help unravel those pappardelle ribbons. Four to six minutes, and we're ready to serve. Okay. Oh, nicely cooked, silky smooth. It's taken on all the flavour of that beautiful goat ragu. All I need to do now is add a little bit of parsley for garnish. 
a little bit of pepper. Be really soft and gentle with those ribbons and just mix it all through. It's amazing. There we have, look at those ribbons. The ragu is super rich and tasty. I can smell it, just make me really hungry. What's a ragu without some parmesan? There you have it. A dish that you take to the table, allow your family and friends to dig in and enjoy it. And I remember Papadelle, to eat with passion. And I think even Louis wouldn't even mind a little smidgen of this one. In the next episode, Adam leaves all this opulence behind to visit the home of St. Francis of Assisi. The priest was so greedy that the popular pastor of the region was Strozzapretti. For this episode's recipes, stories and more, visit adamspastorpilgrimage.com.